going to continue our lesson on pursuing the life of holiness. Deuteronomy chapter 7. And uh, verse 6 and then 1 Peter chapter 2 verse 9. Deuteronomy chapter 7 verse 6 for thou art an whole people a holy people unto the Lord thy God the Lord thy God had chosen thee to be a special people unto himself above all people that are upon the face of the earth and then in 1st Peter chapter 2 and verse 9 for you are a chosen generation a royal priesthood and holy nation, a peculiar people, that ye should show forth the praise of him who hath called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. And God bless you and may be seated. Just as an epilogue to the, um, our discussion on the, the, um, Bible and homosexuality. In, in regard to witnessing to those who are um, homosexual, whether homosexual or lesbian, what, whatever, um, the way you do that is simply the way you do any other um, people that are unsaved. So whether they're shacked up, whether they're in adultery, whether they're in fornication, whatever the case might be, you simply witness to them as per normal. And then of course, the word of God is going to bring conviction as you witness. And if people want to be saved, then they will be saved. You know, if people want to resist truth, they're gonna resist truth whatever the situation might be. We can't, we can't do anything about that. We can only teach them as how far we know. I had one man um, just last week, he said to me that he had someone come to the church and um, um, he thought it was a woman but really it turned out to be a man who had transitioned to be a woman. So he said, what should I do? Well, I said, well, you just got to have to teach. And apparently it started a Bible study with her slash she uh, slash him slash whatever. And so he had started a Bible study. I said, well, just continue to teach that Bible study. And then the word of God will convict them and convict her slash him and then do whatever. Because we're living in a time where we simply can't control what people do. God can't control that. Now God can kill them, but he can't control what they do. So we simply need to teach and show and be long-suffering and see what the Word of God will do. If the Word of God can't change them, of course, then nothing can change them. Amen. So that's what you do. That's how you witness to them. Tonight, then, we're going to deal with our apparel and our adornment. Hebrews 12, 14 says, Follow peace with all men and holiness without which... No man shall see the Lord. So we know that whatever holiness is, we have to follow it or we will not be safe. The text that we read in Deuteronomy said that God had chosen us to be a special people above all the families of the earth. Now, I am, I am hoping that if God chose us to be a special people, that we would think that is really a blessing. And, and we would not count it to be a curse if God chose us, specifically chose us, to come close to him and to be his people, then I think we should count it really as a, as a wonderful opportunity. 
Now we will know that whenever God call us close to him and be in close proximity to him, we can't live like we, we were living when we were way out the backside of the mountain. We know that by biblical principle. If you recall, Moses had been in the backside of the mountain for 40 years, tending his father-in-law's sheep. And God said nothing to him, but the moment that, that God brought him close to himself, and of course he was told, take off the shoes off your feet, but you, you'll, you will see uh, just a few chapters after that, God, that God sought to kill him. Yeah. It, it said God, God sought to kill Moses. This is just after he said, well, you come, I'm sending you to Egypt. And just a few verses after, the Bible said God sought to kill him. Why? Moses had a couple sons that he had not circumcised. As long as you're away from God, he's not saying anything to you. But once you come close to him, pay attention. You got you to gotta clean up and get right. Or else you get in real trouble with God in a hurry. So that means when God chose us as a special people and called us close to him, it just means we have to pay attention to his words. Those people that are in secular churches, God is not even dealing with them because they are far from him. But we are a special people and have been called close to God and so we have to pay attention to his word. Two scriptures we need to consider. 1 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 9 and then we're going to go to the scripture in Deuteronomy 1 Timothy chapter 2 verse 9 in like manner also that women adorn themselves in modest apparel with shamefacedness and sobriety not with broided hair or gold or pearls or costly array and then Deuteronomy chapter 22 verse 5 the woman shall not wear that which pertaineth unto a man, neither shall a man put on a woman's garment, for all that do so are abomination unto the Lord thy God. And so our outward appearance is really a very important aspect of holiness. I heard some, some people said, in times past, and people sometimes quote scripture and, and quote it the way they like it to be, as opposed to what is written. The Bible says we shall not add to the word, neither shall we diminish from the word. So we got to pay attention and read it. One, one of the first law of biblical hermeneutics is read scripture and read it right. Read it correctly. Don't put, don't put in there what you think ought to be there. If the Lord wanted your input, he would have called you and you would have been born several thousands years before and he would have asked you then. So he's really not asking us for our input today. So the, by, he, the, the, this, this, the person said, well, the Bible said, rend your heart, not your garment. Well, which scripture is that? Because it's not in the word of God. It is just from their scripture in their mind. The scripture they were trying to quote is, is uh, or they said, render your heart, not your garment. The scripture they were trying to quote is the one that says, rend your heart, not your garment. And what that was talking about was the fact that God wanted us to rend our heart. He wanted us to, to, to plow up our heart. He wanted to, to, to get our heart softened up as opposed to render. You know, so some people are saying, well, you know, God doesn't care what you wear. Well, that's not true. God is very much in, in, um, in agreement that you really need to pay attention to what you wear. The Bible really teaches us how to dress and how to adorn ourselves and show us principles that will govern our outward appearance. I want you to note carefully the apostles' remarks in, in Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 17. 
he says to the saints, he says, This I say, therefore, and testify in the Lord, that ye henceforth walk not as other Gentiles walk, in the vanity of their mind. So we can't walk like other Gentiles walk. The God, God deal with three classes of people. The Jews, the Gentiles, and the church of the living God. When God dealing with the church of the living God, we can't walk as other Gentiles. Other secular churches, we can't walk like them. They can do whatever they want, but the Bible said we are a special people. And God has chosen us above all of the other families of the earth that we would be close to him. And so we have to be careful how we walk. It is important then to understand principles in the area of dress and adornment because when you think about it, we are some 2,000 years removed from the first century church. As a consequence, there are many things that we face today that the first century church did not. For instance, there is, there is, there is nothing to say um, we can't, in the word of God, it, there's nothing that says don't watch television. There's nothing to say be careful of the internet. N nothing like that. But there are principles. And principles are really laws or ideas or thoughts that God has put in his word that will not change. So principles will not change. When we have, for instance, um, in science, there is a principle of gravity. Now, some people may say, well, I don't believe in gravity. That, that's up to you. That's, that's fine. There's nothing wrong with that. Because that's what you think you don't believe in gravity. Well, I'm not, I'm not going to give you a fight on that. But if you go up in a tree and you jump out, even if you don't believe in gravity, I promise you, you're going to hit that ground pretty fast. And it's, the gravity is going to affect you even if you say you don't believe in it. So there are principles in the word of God. Even if we say we don't believe in it, if the principle is there, it is constant. It can't be changed. So we simply need to acquiesce in what God is trying to get across to us. There's, there are five principles I'm going to touch on tonight. And they are there for us to consider. First, we're going to talk about modesty. The Greek word here for modest is kosmiosos. It means orderly, well-arranged, decent and modest and if you notice the apostle Peter's remarks in 1st Peter chapter 3 and verse number 2 while they behold your chaste conversation coupled with fear the the thing about our, how we carry ourselves it can affect people's perception about us so there are people who probably will not darken the doors of our churches, but how people live, how we live before them, it can change them. How we carry ourselves can change and, and affect them. So they're looking at you. The, sometimes the only God they will know is what they see in you. And so if you carry yourself right, then it can affect people. We also notice that when our parents fell in the garden, the first, the first sin that entered there, we find them covering themselves with fig leaves. Well, we know just by experience that fig leaves is really not a good covering, even if it were broad leaves. I mean, if you're going to have fig leaves, eventually the sun is going to dry that up. Then what? Then it's going to become brittle. 
and they're going to crumble, then what? So God was sensible enough to know that that was not adequate enough. Verse 21 of the first chap of chapter 3, Genesis 3, verse 21. Unto Adam also and to his wife did the Lord God made coats of skin. So he, he knew the fig leaves were inadequate, so God killed animals and clothed them. And of course, the, the, the shedding of the blood there, um, the killing of that animal had two things that was accomplished. First of all, the blood spoke to their sin, and then secondly, the physical covering. But God knew it was not adequate, and so they clothed them. It appears from the, the text in Luke chapter 8, 27, that the devil does precisely the opposite. He unclothed us. Jesus met that man in the tomb, and we're told in verse 27, And when he went forth to the land there, met him out of the city a certain man which had devils a long time, and wear no clothes. Neither abode in any house but in the tomb. So it appears now the devil that was in this man, as it were, gave him some kind of a thought in his mind, so he took his clothes off. So the devil's, the devil's tactic here is to get you naked. Whereas on the other hand, with God, his desire is to clothe you. Verse 35, if you pull verse 35. Then they went out to see what was done and came and came to Jesus and found the man out of whom the devils were departed. He's sitting at the feet of Jesus and observe. He's clothed and in his right mind. So whenever we come to God, God is going to clothe us. The devil will try to take our clothes off. And, and we see that people in all different stages of being naked in our time. Well, that is, that is part of what the devil does. Modest apparel means clothing that does not go towards affecting the senses. Doesn't expose the body to the opposite sex, whether it's intentional or otherwise. That's what modesty does. So the sleeve length, the necklines, the dress length, the tightness of the clothes, the sheerness of the clothes should be taken into consideration when we dress. So that's what modesty is all about. Secondly, we must avoid personal ornamentation. Modest also has the idea of not being showy or flashy. You know, and sometimes you see people trying to be flashy and you said, okay, all right. You know, we're kind of loud clothes. I mean, loud colors. You know, just trying to stand out. Just, I mean, you... You almost had to put dark glasses on when some of these folk walk up to you. I mean, say, so what in the world is happening to you, friend? But you notice it, it said that it should be with shamefacedness and sobriety and not with ornaments and uh, something that is, is elaborately arranged with hair. And the, in, the old, in, the, in the old setting in, in the, the first century, some of those ladies used to try and, and weave all kind of golds and pearls into the actual hair so that there is a, there is a, a, a shot when the light hits it, there is kind of like a glycerin. There's, there, there, there's a, a sign that the, the head has all kinds of stuff going on in there. And so he spoke against that. And people used to do that out in the world. And so when they got saved, Paul had to correct them. We don't want that here. That's not part of being apostolic. And then he talked about costly garments or costly array. Shamefacedness means reverence, self-restraint, modesty, and bashfulness. And then sobriety means 
discretion, temperance, and self-control. So then the dress, therefore, should not be ostentatious, should not be flashy, should not be, should be means of showing off. And then, furthermore, we should not really rely on outward appearance to establish who we are. Why should clothes, the clothes and things that we wear define us? I mean, it, 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 it shouldn't be that, that we rely on things that we put on to define us. We should be who we are. I, I believe that God is smart enough and had enough power to make us with any kind of trappings that he wanted to. He could have added anything he wanted on us. And to me, if he didn't put it on us, we will spare ourselves if we don't put it on ourselves. So we need to have shamefacedness and sobriety. First Peter chapter, uh, chapter 3, if we we'll look at verse 3, yes. Who is adorning, let it not be the outward adorning of the plating of the hair and of the wearing of gold. So how, how, how are ladies adorned? And he was talking in, in this context to the wives, but it applies to all our ladies. Plating of the hair, all that fancy stuff happening in there. Wearing of gold, it shouldn't be that. Shouldn't be you shouldn't be have to be defined by that. Or putting on apparel, verse 4. But let it be the hidden man of the heart. So here's what is important. The hidden man of the heart in that which is not, not corruptible. Now notice here is the ornament that we're, we're supposed to be concerned with. Even the ornament of a meek and quiet spirit which is inside of God of great price. So we, we should be looking more on the inner adornment as opposed to the outer adornment. So scriptures then forbids the adornment with this precious stones and metals and pearls and gold and costly array. Hence, when you talk about jewelry, whether it's real or imitation, from a scriptural standpoint, it is forbidden. And principles are principles. And you shouldn't have to feel like you're not adequate, you're inadequate if you don't have all of that ornamentation on you. I mean, God made you inadequate? I don't think so. And so you should not put that on yourself. The Bible says that we're complete in him. So however God made us, we're complete. And you, we don't have to struggle with our identity because we don't have some things on us. And we will see later on that a lot of those things, if they are not forbidden under one principle, it is not going to be allowed under another principle. Third, we must also consider moderation in cost when we're talking about what we wear. In 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 9, he says, part of that, he says, not with costly array. And, and you say, well, how would you know if it's costly? Well, I mean, sometimes common sense can, can tell you. I mean, if, if I'm coming here and I'm wearing a suit that costs $6,000 and the fellowship hall or, or the education in the wing down there is not finished, I, I, I've got to be thinking now, why are you coming up in this place with a, with, with a suit that costs $6,000 and that place is not finished? I mean, even common sense could, could help us there. You know, and, and, and so sometimes, you know, people, you know, they get some engagement ring. And they are right-handed from all the time they have known themselves. But all of a sudden now, they have a stone on their left finger now, on their left hand. And all of a sudden, they're left-handed because everything is with the left hand. Now, what is that? 
You're trying to show off. I mean, don't fool me, friend. I'm old, but I'm not senile now. When you're doing all of that, you're trying to show it off. So you, you can't be wearing stuff that's costly. And, and maybe you say, well, what's costly? Well, ask somebody, is that costly? And they will look at that tag, oh, yes, that's costly right there. I know what that is. You know, and some of these ladies with different stuff, Louis Vuitton stuff, well, well, yeah, some of those name brand things, well, they cost some money. Why can't you just buy a plain thing? Well, uh, you know, I got to be in keeping with my status. See, that, that's the problem right there. You're, you're, you're allowing things to define you. Things don't define me. I define things. I mean, I, I mean you, you know, I, I, listen. If you're going to be defined by some product, friend, you've got, you've got some insecurity about yourself. You've got some problems. You can't allow things to define you. And so we have to consider how, how much are we spending on things. For instance, we would ask this now. Would that outfit that we have, would, would that, that, that thing we're wearing, would that cause someone to have in, some envy come up in there? There'll be a hint of envy. Well, if there is, probably it's probably just you're spending too much money on that. Because if it's not really, you know, really high quality, they're not even going to see what you're wearing now. But if it's something that is kind of on the expensive side, they're going to see it and they're going to start. You know, we have to consider one another. In the Corinthians church, what they were doing, they had some, some, some uh, wealthy people there. And they were doing things that kind of showed up the less, the less fortunate saints. And Paul said, no, you can't do that. You've got to consider one another. And so if you're going to be coming, you know, some real expensive clothes, it, it may stir envy in, in the saint, in some of the poor saints. Well, we have to, you say, well, that's my clothes and, and that's their problem. Well, no, what you should do if, if you are charitable, go buy them something then and let everybody have the same thing. But I bet you're not going to do that. So we've got to consider that and it, and it sure, it does show that you're a poor steward of what God has given you. If you're going to just go out and splurge and buy clothes or buy things like that. I mean, why not put that in the building fund? Why not help a missionary? Why not help home mission? Why not do something to spread the gospel? Because all of that flashy clothes you're going to wear is going to be burnt up. You're not taking it to heaven now. Has no place in heaven. So you're far better off, instead of buying all that costly array, is put that in the place where it can help the kingdom of God. Fourth, we must maintain the distinction between male and female. This is what Deuteronomy chapter 22 verse 5 is getting at. If you pull that up for me, please. Deuteronomy chapter 22, verse 5. The woman shall not wear that which pertaineth unto a man, and neither shall a man put on, on, put on a woman's garment, for all that do so are abomination. So this is a step above sin. They are abomination. We know that there are biological differences between the sexes. Of course, we know that. But there's also the mental and emotional differences, too. And uh, God is wanting us to maintain a separation 
between the sexes. He really doesn't want a blurring of that separation. He wants there to be a distinction. And this, of course, will also prevent homosexuality. You need to, you, the, the reason why you see this thing is proliferating so much is because that the onslaught of the devil is trying to blur that line of separation between a man and a woman. So sometimes now, with some of these folk, you don't know what, whether that's a man or a woman. You say, but, but wait a minute. Did you just see what, what is that a, is that a, is that a man or is that a woman? Because the last time I heard there's just male and female, but, but this kind of, you don't know what that is. Mommy, who, mommy, what? You know, because our children, you know, they're, they're curious. This four-year-old, mommy, what, what is that? And then a mommy have to just cover their mouth. No, don't say it. But God is wanting them to maintain the distinction. And he has two things that he uses in scripture. The dress and the hair. And I'll talk about the hair probably next week. But those two things are used by God to make this distinction and maintain this distinction, which is very important. There are roles that, that the male is going to fulfill in 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 society and the one that the woman is going to fulfill, they are different. And God is saying, just maintain that and it's going to help us guard against homosexuality. So therefore, when we talk about, when people talk about unisex clothing, this is strictly ungodly. Absolutely ungodly. It's something that God hates. He said it's an abomination. So it's not just normal, ordinary sin, but it, it is an abomination. And, and we need to remember that God doesn't change his likes and his dislikes. I mean, you and I might acquire a taste for something or change. God is not like that. Everything that God likes or hates, they are like an iron bar that doesn't change. Doesn't change 2013, 14. God is the same eternity's past. He doesn't change. All of his moral attributes, same. If you look at Malachi chapter 3 and verse 6. For I am the Lord, I change not. So we know God doesn't change. So we cannot argue that since now is 2013, then God's mind is different from from. AD 32 or AD 60. We cannot say that because God does not change. We change, but God does not. So whatever God hated in the first century, he still hates today. Whatever he hated in the Genesis, he still hates today. So God doesn't change. And we, our mind can't, we, sometimes we don't understand that. So whatever God said back in the Genesis, he is saying the same thing today. And you say, well, God, you mean you don't get modernized? No. And God looks you back and says, no. Simply does not change. So wearing clothes of the opposite sex is an abomination to God. And further, you will notice it says that which pertains unto a man, pertaineth unto a man. This means any kind of clothing that was traditionally associated with a man or pattern after a man's clothes is the same thing. In the Western culture, in our culture, the distinctive clothing for a man is the pants. The distinctive clothing for the woman is the dress. I mean, even, even when you go into public areas, public, 
restroom you're at the airport and so forth even when they're announcing the restrooms for men it has like a silhouette of a man for the ladies it has a silhouette of a woman that is because that's traditionally that's how it is so if it pertains to a man it has something to do with a man if it pertains to a woman so you a man cannot start to become a cross dresser and talking about he is at liberty to do that you cannot cross dress and go to heaven you go to hell for that the the practice of of women wearing pants we know this happened after the sec primarily after the second world war when you had a lot of men at, at, at war and you had the ladies trying to eke out a living and so they went into the workforce. But from the beginning, it was not like that. And I'm talking about just unsaved people. And uh, I, would, I would think that if I came in here in a woman's dress, somebody is going to say, Pastor, what, what happened to you? And most, most denominal, even in secular denominal churches, if they had a pastor walked in there, knew he was a man, he's been a man all his life, he, he walked up in there a Sunday morning with a dress. Most of those people are not staying in there. Promise it. Because this, we, we know traditionally in our Western culture, the pants is associated with the man, the dress with the woman. And then some, you know, I've had people said, well, a woman's pants are made for women. Well, let me ask you this. If you are here and she is down where the, the handicap uh, park and are now how are you going to tell how that dress is made or how that pair of pants is made you're simply going to say well she hasn't a pair of pants you're not going to be able to tell furthermore they are patterned after it says pretended unto so they're patterned after a man's clothing and would then it would then fit under that which pertains to a man. And many times when the, when the pants are designed for women, they will break another principle because those dresses, those pants are normally tight fitting. They're tight fitting and they, they really violate the principle of modesty. So either way, you're not going to get away with that. And, and so we, 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 we simply need to agree with God and say, yes, Lord. Women will not wear anything that pertains to a man and vice versa. Because God is trying to maintain the distinction between the sexes. He wants a man to be a man and a woman to be a woman. And they should not try and and cross dress and and one dress this way and the other dress that way and well you wear my dress today and i'll wear your pants no you get your own clothes and get appropriate clothes well we're trying to save money well yeah buy less expensive clothes hello fifth we must maintain a separation from the world. In the word of God, you will see from the get-go in the Genesis that the Lord is separating. Separated in the Genesis, the very first few verses, separated the light from the darkness. It means that all God always put difference. He puts a difference between light and darkness. Puts a difference between the Hebrew and the Egyptian. He puts difference between clean and unclean. Puts difference between the righteous and the profane. God always wants to have a difference. And we, we maintain difference also. I've always used the illustration that 
most of us in our kitchen, we have a, we have a sink that has two compartments to it. And usually, you know, and I will stand corrected in your house, it's different. Usually on the left-hand side, the dirty dishes go there. On the right-hand side, the clean dishes go there. So you wash it, wash it in the left, and then you rinse it and so forth, and you put it in the right. And you don't mix them. We maintain, we maintain the, the principle of separation. That's clean. That's dirty. And if someone inadvertently, after they've had their dinner and the gravy is just still on that plate, and if they inadvertently put it in the right hand sink, now you've got to take the whole confection out and put it in the left hand sink and wash it over. And you say, dummy, make sure you look the next time. That is the clean sink. That's how we do that. So we have to maintain separation. And that is precisely what God does to the church. We have to maintain a separation between the church and the world. And we don't mix them. One is clean. One is dirty. You say, well, are they dirty? Well, yes. Such were some of you, but you're washed. At one time we were dirty, but God washed us. He took us from that dirty left hand sink. He washed us and put us in the right hand sink. And he says, maintain a difference. Maintain a separation. That's what God is doing. And God doesn't really want us to get dirty again. So in order for us to stay clean, we have to stay separated. If you remember, we talked about Israel. Israel, the basis upon upon which they were going to stay in covenant with God was their separation from those seven nations. You remember those seven nations? Pezrazite, the Hivites, the Jerusite, all of those ites. The only way they would stay in covenant with God and friendship with God is if they remained totally separated from those seven nations. It's not that they were any better than them, but Israel was called close to be to God. And so he said, you need to stay separated. And we can ask ourselves this question. Why has the Jew continued on to today? The Jewish nation right now, they number probably somewhere between six and seven million in that place in Palestine. Why have they continued so many years, Abraham was called roughly 2,000 years before Jesus was born. And that descendant from Abraham through Isaac and Jacob and the 12th patriarch, that descendant has remained separated. They came out of Egypt, some two and a half million of them. And they have remained separated pretty much from the world by their law. And they have existed unto today. Today they're still a nation. Whereas the Egyptian, are, they're still Egyptian, but they're different from the days of the Pharaoh. Look at, look at things like the Romans. The Romans are gone. Romans were prominent at one time, but they have disappeared. The Persians have gone. The Greeks have gone. The Hittites have gone. The Edomites have gone. The Assyrians have gone. The Babylonians, all of those folks have gone, disappeared. But Israel has continued. They have been like that. Why? There's separation. If we are going to remain before God, we have to be separated. If we're going to head to heaven, we have got to remain separated from the world. And God is worthy. He, God, I mean, the thrust of what we do is to please God. I mean, at least we ought to. Lord, how do we please you? That's what, that really what, what it's all about. It's not just being religious. If some folk, well, I'm just religious. I got a big Bible. Well, that's not going to re recommend you to God. But if you're separated from the rest of the world and you're dedicated or sanctified and set apart for God's use, then God can use you, but he cannot use you in the world. 
So he called us out of the world and caused us to be separated. The apostle Peter said that we are royal priesthood. In 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 9, he said, but ye are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, an holy nation, a peculiar people, and that you should show forth the praises of him who have called you out of darkness into marvelous light. You will also notice in 1 John chapter 2 and verse 15, love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, three things, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. And it's not of the Father, but it's of the world. And he says the world is going to pass away and the lust thereof, but they that do the will of God will abide forever. The world is filled with carnality. In Romans chapter 8 and verse 5. For they that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh, but they that are after the spirit the things of the spirit. And we are after the spirit. So we got to mind the things of the spirit, i.e. the things that please God. Verse 6. For the carnal mind, for to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Because the carnal mind, he says, is enmity against God. There's a war, for it is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. So then, they that are in the flesh cannot please God. Verse 9, but ye are not in the flesh. The church of the living God, we have to say we are not in the flesh. Why? Because we have the spirit of God living in us. Say, but you're not of the flesh, but is in the, but is in the spirit. If so, be that spirit of, of God dwell in you now. If any man have not the spirit of Christ, he is none of his. So we need the Holy Ghost to please God. And if we are always full of the Holy Ghost, always stirring up the Holy Ghost in us, our desire, our, our disposition would be how can we please God? That should be our motto. Lord, what are you going to have me to do? How can I please you? I, I'm not going to walk according to the course of this world because it's, it's carnality, it's enmity. There is a war between you and the world. But I want to be at peace. I want to be in covenant with you. I want to be close to you. I want to know that you are pleased with my life. How do I do that? I got to walk in the spirit. Notice Jesus is... Remarks in John chapter 17 and verse 15 and 16. I pray not that thou shouldest take them out of the world, but thou shouldest keep them from the evil. So there is a lot of evil in the world. They are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. How are we not of the world? We have the Holy Ghost. And we have been transformed. If you also notice in Romans, in Romans chapter 12, there, there's, I mean, our, our time is going away from us. But in Romans chapter 12, verse 2, we're told that we can't even get to conform to this world. And be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. So we're not going to let the world put us into its mold. We're not going to do that. But we're going to strive to please God. I'm going to say just a little bit about uh, colored makeup and tattoos. You know, I noticed today people, some, some folks, especially some of those athletes, you see them, I mean, they've got tattoos all over them. You say, what is happening? The devil is at work. Now, people don't admit it's the devil, but I'm going to tell you it's the devil is at work. When you've got all of that colored makeup and tattoos, this is contrary to the principle of avoiding ostentatiousness and ornamentation and avoiding vanity because people walk according to the vanity of their mind. 
But women, for instance, scripture said that they have to adorn themselves with modest, in modest apparel. And then they have to do it with shamefacedness and sobriety. Shamefacedness, as I mentioned, means respect, reverence, self-restraint, modesty, or bashfulness toward men. That is, you're not bold or forward. There is an incident in 2 Kings, if you put that up for me, 2 Kings chapter 9, verse 30, when Jehu came in to town to execute judgment upon Ahab's house for what he had done, Jezebel painted her face. The Bible said, and when Jehu was come to Jezreel, Jezebel heard of it, and she painted her face and tired and tied her head and looked out of the window. So she was trying to seduce and to thwart what Jehu had come to do in town. And, and, and really, that is what that's all about, to seduce. But we need to recognize where God is going with this whole program. I know time is going to fail me, but I wanted to go to one more, go to read one more part in and in Isaiah, if you pull up Isaiah chapter 3, verse 16 for me. Talk about the ornamentation. Moreover, the Lord said, because the daughter of Zion are haughty and walk with stretched forth necks and wanton eyes, walking and mincing as they go, making a tinkling with their feet. Therefore, the Lord will smite with a scab the crown of the head of the daughters of Zion, and the Lord will discover their secret parts. In that day, the Lord will take away the bravery of their tinkling ornaments about their feet. See, even back there, they had it around their feet and their calls and their round tires like the moon. The chains and the bracelets and the mufflers, the bonnets and the ornaments of the legs and the headbands and the tablets and the earrings, the rings and the nose jewels, and the changeable suit of apparel and the mantles and the wimples and the crispin pins, the glasses and the fine linen and the hoods and the veils. And that's not like when we talk about we'll, people live in the hood. That's, that's a different kind of hood right there. And it came to pass, and it shall come to pass, that instead of the sweet smell, there shall be stink. Instead of the girl of rent, and instead of the well-set hair baldness, and instead of the stomacher girding of the sackcloth and burning instead of beauty, the men shall fall by the sword. And it, it goes on. So... The, the essence of that is the ornamentation is not according to the will of God. We're in all those things. God is smart enough. If he wanted to make us with all of that thing, he was able to do that by himself. We should then ask ourselves, whatever we're going to wear, whatever we're going to put on, is it serving any useful purpose? For instance, if you have a... If you have a, a, a watch on, well, that's functional. It serves a purpose. But putting on all kinds of things on your wrist, what purpose does it serve? It doesn't per serve any purpose, so you take it off. I've, I've seen people with, with rings, I mean, 10 rings on their finger. What purpose does it serve? None. Then you take them off. People in, in our culture, many of them wear a wedding band. That's fine because it's functional. There's a reason. But having all rings on your finger just to be ostentatious and, and show that you've got something, you got to be careful. You go in the hood, people, you may come out of there with no fingers. They cut all of those fingers off and take all of those things on you got on there. So we got, you know, we got to think about these things. So does it serve any reasonable purpose? Is it, is it extravagant? What is your motive in wearing that? So we got to ask ourselves these questions and then recognize that God is going to deal with our hearts. If you, you allow God to deal with your heart relative to these principles, we're going we're gonna to strive to please God. And also, in, in closing, let me, let's pull up uh, Leviticus chapter 19 and verse 28. You shall not make any cuttings in your flesh. And the cuttings in the flesh was, 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 was mainly for their dead. <laughs> because that would be the most pervasive or persuasive 
a motive. People die and you put this, and you know, and, and even now people die and people put various things, but you're not supposed to do that. So no markings on yourself, no tattoos. And then um, chapter 21, verse 5, I believe. They shall make no baldness upon their head, neither shall they shave off the corner of their beard, nor make any cuttings in their flesh. All of these things were really not good. When you make cutting in your flesh, are you going to, I mean, if you had to pierce your ear, you're cutting your flesh. So that would violate the principle of God. So you can't do that. God is not wanting you to cut anything to put any markings on there. Because he was smart enough to do that if he wanted to. The challenge for us today as apostolic and as people of God, are we going to remove those ancient landmarks? Or are we going to maintain them so that we can maintain our our identity and please God. Are we going to are we going to go in, in in concert with the world? Are we going to tell the world here is how you live? Are we going to allow the world to force us in its mold? We should be resolute. We should be determined not to allow the world to force us in its mold. So God help us that we don't we don't do any crazy things like that. We need to, we need to resist the onslaught of the devil. Because the devil knows he has a short time to come. And he, there is an onslaught against the people of, the world, uh, uh, people of God. And when we deal with our children, we should not then as adults do the things for God and the things that are conducive to sound doctrine. And then let our kids dress like the world. Why would you want to put, uh, as a young, young female, why would you want to put pants on them? The Bible says you've got to train them in the way should, they should go. And they should not wear pants, so they should not wear them when they're young. So the same thing applies to them. That applies to the adults. And I, 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 I do know that in this church, for instance, there are ministry guidelines and every saint of God that is going to be involved in ministry have to comply with that guideline. Because we are trying to please God. We're not, I'm not here trying to please men. That's not my purpose. Not, not here to, oh yeah, pastor let us do what we want. Well, no. I mean, my responsibility is to show you what is in the word of God. And to urge you to earnestly... Contend for the faith. Our separation is going to bring us power and unction. Our separation is going to bring us God's favor. Our separation from the world and, and adherence to the word of God is going to help us that we will save the world. If we're just like the world, then we can help the world. But when the world sees Disaster is coming. They're going to run for refuge. And we ought to be that beacon. We ought to be that place where they can come. And so we've got to maintain what God has given to us. And we've got to dress like that. And we've got to live like that. And we don't need to live like the world. God bless you. We can stand. I'm done. How quickly the time gets away. I'm going to deal with hair next week. Hair is also the second leg that God used to keep this distinction between the sexes. And it's very, very important. Very necessary for us to know what says the word of God. Acts 2.38 is right. Absolutely required. But then the Bible said we have to pursue, pursue holiness. Because without holiness, no man shall see God. Of all God's moral attributes, the one that he would much have us remember him by is his absolute holiness. That he is separated from sin and from sinners. <laughs>